I want to take you back to the gospel from two Sundays ago. Do you remember it? Jesus sent his disciples, the twelve, in twos to go and cure the sick, expel demons. Then last Sunday, the disciples came back and they were sharing with Jesus what they did. And Jesus told them, let us go to a place, deserted place, so you can rest. So they got on the boat, but the people knew where they were going. And by the time they reached where they were going, the people were already there. And Jesus, moved by compassion, he saw the people as sheep without a shepherd. So he sat down and began to teach them. And today, we hear about how Jesus, moved with compassion, was concerned about the people eating, having something to eat after they've been with him for a long time. He taught them and he fed them. Does that sound familiar? That should sound familiar to everyone because that's what we do at Mass. We come to be fed at the table of the Lord. We listen to the Word of God. We are being taught by God. And that's, then God calls us to come and be fed with the body and blood of His only Son. Another thing about the Gospels, we have been reading from the Gospel of Mark until today. It's from the Gospel of John. And for the next, usually it's five, uh, four more Sundays, we'll hear from the Gospel of John. But this year, because Assumption falls on a Sunday, so the readings will switch. But the reason we're reading from the Gospel of John is because for our readings, we follow a three-year cycle. There's cycle A, B, and C. And in each one of these cycles, in cycle A, the Gospel is mostly from the Gospel of Matthew. Cycle B, which is our current cycle, is from the Gospel of Mark, and Cycle C is from the Gospel of Luke. But you say, what about the Gospel of John? Well, in each of these years, we read from the Gospel of John, especially during the Easter season. But because the Gospel of Mark is the shortest Gospel, that's why we have a longer time period where, like I said, usually it's five weeks in the summer, to read from the Gospel of John. And those five weeks are taken from one chapter in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, the chapter known as the Bread of Life Discourse. Every Catholic should be familiar with John chapter 6. Because in the Gospel of John, John doesn't describe to us on the Last Supper what Jesus took with the bread and what he did when he took the bread and wine and said, this is my body and this is my bread, my blood. He devotes all of chapter 6 to lead us to what's the true meaning of the Eucharist. What is it that we receive? It's not a symbol. It's not a sign. It is Jesus. It's truly his flesh and his blood. And that comes around towards the end of the chapter. So the first thing I would like you to recommend to you is take a few minutes and read all of chapter 6 so you can get a better understanding of the whole chapter rather than hearing it section by section. But what I'd like to do during these next four weeks is go through a journey through the Mass, try to help us or remind us what the Mass is all about. All of these things that we do, what do they mean? What's the purpose of them? Are they relevant? And today I'd like to begin by talking about the church as a building, what makes a building a Catholic church, and then the introductory rites from the entrance all the way to the opening prayer before we start with the reading. Every Catholic church should have some characteristics that makes it a Catholic church. The first thing is the altar. That's where we celebrate the Eucharist. The altars, some of them are in the shape of a tombstone or a grave, because that's where the early Christians celebrated Mass when it wasn't, you know, legal to do it in public. They will go to the cemeteries and celebrate the Mass over the tombs of the martyrs, those who died for their faith. In every altar, there is relics of a certain saint or sometimes more than a saint. I haven't, no, I don't know yet what the relics here are, but I probably am a saint or Clem knows that. Also in the Catholic Church, we need to have a tabernacle. That's where we reserve the Blessed Sacrament. 
Because we believe when the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ, it stays the body and blood of Christ, not only during Mass. So the tabernacles were erected so you can reserve the blessed sacrament, the body of Christ. Obviously, we don't reserve the blood of Christ, so it can be taken to the sick during the week. And usually next to it, there is this lead lamp that's called the sanctuary lamp to remind us and help us know where is the tabernacle in the church. Also in the Catholic Church, you have an ambo where the Word of God is being proclaimed. We have the presider's chair where the priest sits there as a sign that the priest has been sent by the bishop, just like Jesus sent the apostles and gave them the power. The reason I'm pastor of Holy Family is because the bishop gave me that power. I couldn't on my own come say, well, you know, I'm looking for a job. Would you want me to be your pastor? No, we're sent by the bishop who is the representative of Christ in the archdiocese. And then what we need also have is the stations of the cross that reminds us of Jesus' last hours of life and how much, how much he endured pain and suffering because he loves us, not because he loves suffering, but because he loves us, and how despite the suffering, he remained faithful to the Father's will to become our Savior. And finally, we all have the crucifix. That's the summation of the Christian message, that we're called to love, a love that calls us to sacrifice, to give of ourselves, to share ourselves with others just like God shared all his being, his life, his knowledge, his wisdom, his power. He all put it on the cross because he loves us. So these are what makes a Catholic church or a building a Catholic, all of these signs and symbols. Now, usually when we come to Mass, you first enter and you put your fingers in the, in the holy water and make the sign of the cross on yourself. The reason we do this is to remind us who are we? Why are we here today? That's exactly what we do when we baptize someone into the church. Usually the priest or deacon, they'll meet him at the doors of the church, and there they'll trace the sign of the cross in their forehead, and then they'll come in, and then we'll be baptized later. So as we come in, we are reminded that we are here because we are, have been baptized. Now we are members of God's family, and we're coming together as God's family. We're coming together in our Father's house, to thank him, to praise him, to listen to him, and so he can feed us with the heavenly food. As you walk in, it's a traditional for us that if the tabernacle is in the middle of the church, that we genuflect to the tabernacle, you go down, bend down on one knee, because it's Jesus present there. But in this case, because it's on the side usually, and we'll come in to celebrate Mass, usually we bow to the altar. The altar is a symbol of Christ, it's not Christ. The Eucharist is Jesus. And then you enter your pew and you can maybe kneel if you wanna say a few prayers or just sit and collect yourself and sometimes people, you know, greet those around them. And sometimes that's where we see some kind of friction at the mass between those who want the mass to be a quiet time for them, just for them and Jesus to be quiet to see it more reverence, more respect, and others see it more as a family reunion where everybody is talking to everyone and, you know, welcoming everyone. If you're following the news, you know, that was in the news lately when Pope Francis decided that he's going to put more restriction on celebrating the Latin Rite Mass, the pre-Vatican II Mass, when at Vatican II all things were changed from Latin to English and all of these changes. And the media usually makes a big deal of it. You think, oh, the church is going to fall apart. My friends, let's keep focus on what happens at the Mass. It's the Word of God proclaimed, and it's the body and blood of Jesus that's offered to us. If you want to be more respectful and more quiet, that's fine. If others want to be, you know, more sociable, that's fine. But be mindful of those who want more respect. Nobody is stopping us from being respectful. You know, it doesn't matter what style of mass appeals to you. What's important is, are you encountering Christ? Do you feel that you are Christ's presence when you come to mass? You know, I never heard people saying, oh, you know, I went to this restaurant 
did you see their China pattern? It's horrible. I'm not going to go back again. Nobody cares about their China. They care about the food. And that's what we need to be focused on. There is different parishes with different styles of worship, different priests with different styles of worship, and that's fine. You know, we're a 2,000-year history old church. We have different ways of celebrating the same things, thanking God for his word and thanking God for the heavenly food that he gives us. Just find a place where you feel more comfortable, where you're more in encounter with Christ. Then the Mass begins, the cantor will greet us. You'll see the procession. The first person in the procession is the server carrying the cross. We are on a journey. We come from the world and we are journeying. That's what the procession represents to God's presence, to this sanctuary area. And we follow Jesus on this journey. We follow the sign of cross, the sign of love and commitment faithfulness even in difficult times. Follow the cross, you have two servers carrying candles. That's because Jesus is the light of the world. We don't make this journey in darkness. We don't make it alone. We make it with Jesus who lights our way to heaven. Then the lector or the deacon will carry the book of the Gospels, you know, the word of Jesus in the Gospels. And then the priest who is also the presence of Christ, just like Jesus is present in the community, comes in to lead us in this celebration. And when we come here, you'll see the ministers reverence the altar with a bow or a bow of the head, and the priests will go around and also kiss their altar as a sign of reverence. Then we begin with the sign of the cross again and the introduction, you know, the grace and peace of our Lord be with you. And usually these greetings are taken from the letters of St. Paul to the communities he wrote, so they're from Scripture. And then we come to a moment to remember, yes, we are God's children, but also we are sinners. We're not perfect yet. We're work in progress. So with humility, we acknowledge our sinfulness and ask God for forgiveness before we partake and share in this heavenly banquet. And that's when we pray the different, you know, penitential rites, I confess to Almighty God, or Lord have mercy. And then God responds to our humility, to our prayers for mercy and forgiveness. And God's response was to send us his son, Jesus, our savior. So we sing the Gloria that reminds us of Christmas when the angels sang to the shepherds, glory to God in the highest. A savior has been born to you in Bethlehem. So we're reminded how God responds to us. You know, the mass is a relationship. It's back and forth between us and God. And after the Gloria, then we start with the opening prayer. It's called the colic, and that's one of three prayers. Every Sunday, no matter where you go in the Catholic Church, we're going to pray those three prayers. And that ends the introductory rites. So next week, we'll continue with the Liturgy of the Word, which is the second part of the Gospel, of the Mass, and where we sit and listen to the Word of God. So every Sunday, I'm going to take you through one part of the Mass so we can cover it during the time we're reading from John chapter 6. But again, I recommend to you and ask you, take a few minutes and just read the whole chapter so you can be more familiar with it and see how Jesus leads us through that chapter to the, what's really the climax of the chapter when he talks about eating his body and drinking his blood.